This video was several months in the making. I was really excited about having finally finished the script and having it run uh, successfully for the very first time. Um, so it is three in the morning and I have decided that that does not matter. I am going to be walking you through it anyway. So what exactly are we doing today? Well, you see, ever since I was a small child, uh, it has been a desire of mine to have my very own Linux distribution. Um, and it occurred to me recently that it is actually possible to create and install a Debian-based installation, installation using an Alpine Linux uh, install disk. This is the idea. So we take Alpine Linux, we install it onto a thumb drive as if the thumb drive were a hard drive, and then we use that hard drive to run a bash script um, that then installs Debian onto your main hard drive. Now obviously there are a million other ways to do this. You could create a, uh, a NIT RAM FS system uh, with Alpine Linux uh, so that you're not literally booting the drive as if it is a hard drive. But fortunately Alpine Linux is small enough and weird enough that I don't necessarily feel terribly uncomfortable installing it onto a thumb drive as if it is a hard drive. Um, additionally, it actually has uh, a bit of a secondary function as a self-healing installation disk, which means that in theory, if I wanted to add some functionality to uh, allow this thumb drive to update itself, um, I can actually do that, which is really useful. But probably most importantly, this is one of the absolute easiest ways to get um, your own sort of customized Debian-based distribution installed on a different computer. An excellent weird use case for Alpine. Some of the solutions out there for creating your own Debian or Ubuntu-based systems essentially just have you back up your computer's hard drive to a NITRAM FS on a thumb drive. And I'm sorry, but that really isn't a great solution. Um, not only does it cause uh, weirdness to come into play when you want to give it to somebody else because you're essentially just cloning your hard drive and giving it to them um, but it also sometimes prevents you from being able to create thumb drives with images larger than four gigabytes and I'm not a huge fan of that so I'm going to be walking you through um, the script that I wrote in order to uh, get Debian installed from an Alpine system, um, but I'm also going to show you how to install Alpine onto a thumb drive as if that thumb drive were a hard drive in and of itself. Now, as I'm doing that, you're going to notice that the script on the left side of the screen is uh, slightly different than uh, what it may appear to be in a second. Um, and the reason for that is I actually installed uh, Alpine to a thumb drive and then I started tweaking this script because I noticed it had some issues. Um, so just ignore that during the install. Um, shortly, I'm going to walk you through this script line by line as I am installing this on a real computer. And uh, whatever the current version is um, on my GitHub, that's the version you're going to want to use. So without further ado, let's continue. Editor's note, I just sort of jumped in without opening VMware. I should not be making this at uh, I think it's now four in the morning. Uh, anyway, so what I'm going to move on and do is uh, I'm going to open VMware and I'm going to have, I've already downloaded uh, the latest version of Alpine Linux, um, the installation ISO, and I'm loading it into this virtual machine. Um, now we'll only need this virtual machine to create the USB that we'll then use as the installer disk. Um, but if you already have Alpine Linux installed on a different machine, um, you can use it instead of the VM. Um, fortunately, this will not write any data uh, to anything but the USB, so you don't have to worry about it. With that said, let's move on to the part of the video I finished an hour ago. So as you can see, uh, I've got VMware running on this machine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get this thing going. Um, you can't see it, but I've got a little uh, USB stick plugged into my machine. And yes, I would like to boot from ISO. Um, I am going to go to, um, I think it's in removable drives, PNY USB and I'm going to connect it to the virtual machine. Now when OpenRC is done, uh, we are going to be presented with a uh, user account prompt. Uh, once this is done working, I should be able to unplug this thumb drive, uh, plug it into an actual machine, and go from there. And in fact, I've got a laptop lying around. I'm gonna plug this in and I'm gonna show you what it looks like. So when you uh, are booting from a live uh, Alpine Linux CD, you're gonna be presented with a login you can just put in root and uh, you'll be right in. Um, I'm gonna run the setup alpine command and I'm gonna go through some of the uh, just default settings.
Yes, I'm getting a soda at 3 in the morning. I am a Linux developer. I can do whatever I want. Well, uh, I kind of wish I had a time command for that, but after about 10 minutes, it would appear as if the installation is finally complete. Now, here's going to be a treat for you guys. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, shut down this virtual machine. And by doing so, this should uh, eject the disk from the drive. And I have a laptop that is not sitting too far away from me. And what that means is I'm going to, in fact, um, take the drive out of my laptop. I'll take this laptop. So you can see here, um, it has Ethernet plugged into the back. Um, so I'll be able to ensure that it has a stable internet connection. I'm going to turn the computer off and turn it back on. And I'm going to go into the boot menu and I'm going to boot from the thumb drive. So this right here is a Dell, which means that the uh, BIOS boot menu select screen um, is triggered through the F12 key. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click that. Um, if you'll just give me 10 seconds, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, cables. See there? USB storage device. There we go. Um, excuse me. Yes, perfection. Ah, oh, it's coming to life. See? So this is um, OpenRC, which is the uh, init system with Alpine, um, currently booting up from the thumb drive, hard drive, that we just created using the virtual machine. Now, the script that I'm going to be walking you through takes about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, in some cases. Um, to install everything onto your computer, uh, just because uh, dbootstrap, which is what it's based on, uh, pulls everything from the internet. And uh, what that means is I'm going to be having this script running in the background on this laptop while I'm walking you through it. And by the time I'm done walking you through each line, um, it should be done. So I can demonstrate for you what it will look like once it is complete. Now. I do not care how you get the script on the computer. My recommendation is use Git. Uh, you could just enter, um, I'll type it in, why not? And this is all public, so you should be able to pull this off uh, and uh, without any issues. And then once you've done that, you can then use the cd command from your Alpine directory, Debian bootstrap script. And then once you're in, you should see uh, my readme file and then install.sh and set up debian.sh. And you're going to want to run install.sh. And that should take care of your system from there. However, I do not recommend that you actually run this script as is. This script is more or less a template uh, for you to create your own systems. Um, only run it on computers where you are 100% confident that you want to destroy everything on one of your hard drives to install your new Debian-based system. Um, but I still think that the, probably the primary use of this is to reverse engineer um, and to use in your own projects, and of course to have fun. Now let's take a look through the code base now, shall we? So what you're actually going to want to run, and I might, I might fix this nomenclature so it's a little bit more obvious, um, you're actually going to want to run the install.sh command. Um, so what you're noticing here, uh, potentially, is that I am automatically setting the setup Debian script um, as executable, and I'm installing a couple of commands ahead of time. So by default, Alpine uses the ASH um, shell, and we want to use bash, because there are a few commands that bash has that ASH does not. Um, That'll make our lives a little bit easier later on. Um, so after this is done, it goes ahead and runs the setup debian.sh script. Let's take a look at that real quick. So it's set up to run as bash. Set hyphen e means if there is an error, kill the script. This is extremely useful uh, for later on. Obviously, I'm going to want to incorporate a warning that lets people know that this is going to wipe out uh, whatever is on the hard drive they are installing to. So if you like your partition table, then don't run this on your machine. Uh, next, I use a little bit of bash tomfoolery 
to figure out what all of the devices under dev SD are. Um, this will return um, your main hard drive, which is probably going to be dev forward slash SDA. Um, and in fact, if your uh, output, or really if your input is uh, not formatted correctly, it's just going to default to dev SDA. Um, this bash allows you to choose which one you want, um, and then after it's selected, it sets it, uh, it takes whatever value you, you chose, and it puts it in the disk variable. Um, now let's move on. So a lot of people don't understand this when they're walking into the Linux world from uh, Mac or Windows. Uh, in fact, some people who are uh, exclusively on um, GUI Linux don't even get this because your desktop environment or uh, perhaps your file manager, may it be Nautilus as an example, uh, will automatically mount any USB drive that you stick into your computer. Um, but what you should know is that they don't actually mount your drives by default. On top of that, um, wherever your drive is at, like if your main hard drive is dev SDA, uh, that is not a directory. You cannot go into dev SDA and then see all your files. Um, that is a file that represents a mountable um, drive uh, with as many partitions and file systems and whatever is there may be on it. Um, so what you actually want to do is you want to tie together a partition to a folder. We're going to be using the mkdir command, uh, make directory. Um, with the p attribute, um, it means it doesn't create the directory if it already exists. And we're going to name it mnt, and this is going to represent the root base directory for a newly created file system. Um, and we're going to zap the existing partition table on the drive, so this is not actually removing all of your information, all it's doing is just sort of wiping out the partition table. If you use a command to get your data back, uh, you probably still will be able to. If you want to completely wipe the drive for real, you'll want to use the dd command, but that's a little bit outside the scope of this video. Um, next, we're going to use the parted command to um, set your partition style as GPT. Uh, GPT and um, UEFI are very highly correlated, um, so if you don't use GPT, then um, there is a good chance uh, your machine will not be able to automatically pick up on your EFI instance, and therefore uh, you'll have to do some BIOS tomfoolery to even get it to boot, and you don't want to do that. Uh, it's more of a headache than it's worth, um, and in a lot of ways the GNU partition table is uh, superior, so we're just going to go with that. Um, next we're going to go to the parted command, uh, we're going to create two partitions. One of them is going to represent uh, a small FAT32 partition where all of our um, EFI files and configuration is going to sit. And then a second will be uh, an ext4 uh, journaling file system, um, which is where we're going to put uh, your Debian folders and directories. Um, and the first one is going to start at the beginning of the hard drive and go to about 512 megabytes. And then we're just going to fill the rest of it up with your primary. You can adjust these values however you see fit, but this is a pretty good um, amount for most people. I like to use the yes command to sort of automate some of this, but you don't actually need it. Um, this right here is going to make, uh, we already we already flagged uh, those file systems for those partitions, but we need to actually format it. So this is going to format the second partition as um, ext4, um, and then it's going to mount it under the mmt folder. Now dbootstrap. I'm going to give you a very small spiel about um, jails. If you are familiar with the BSD world, you are going to be intimately familiar with these. Um, essentially what it does is it sets up almost like a cardboard city um, of all of the major directories that you want to work with, such that if you want to process that potentially could run um, maliciously or dangerously, you give it a copy or its own little special environment uh, where it thinks it's on your main system and has access to all of your folders. But instead, uh, if it were to do things like delete your home folder, uh, it's only doing that within this little, like, this jail. Um, but it's also really useful, believe it or not, for installing um, systems onto your computer. Uh, because it does such a good job of setting up a Debian instance as if it were real, that it can be used to make real ones. So uh, we're going to be setting this to the uh, AMD64 um, processor architecture. I'm using Debian Buster. I'm installing it to forward slash MNT, which is, like we mentioned, the second partition on the hard drive. And I'm pulling from this website. Uh, next, I'm going to be formatting the uh, EFI partition, uh, FAT32. Um, 
so that you know any operating system can take a look at it. Um, I'm going to make this directory inside of the first directory, um, and I'm going to mount that. Now the reason why I'm doing this is because I am going to use the chroot command, and I'm actually going to jump into this jail to set some things up. Um, and basically it allows you to use your operating system before it's even done installing, and that's super duper duper useful. Um, and we want to use uh, some grub commands to automatically register the system with the newly created EFI. Um, and so that's why we're setting up inside, so it'll know where to look. Uh, next, we're going to take some of the system folders, um, like for example, dev, proc, and sys. Um, and we are going to um, bind the real ones to the ones inside the ch root. Uh, and the reason for this is because uh, these are actually important to keep your mind up. I'd like to be to be aware of, uh, or at least for the system to be aware of, um, for especially this one. Uh, this right here is how the ch root is able to interact with your actual system's uh, BIOS and the EFI variables set on the system. Um, and we want that so that when your computer reboots, um, it knows where to look, and it's not just um, it's trapped inside this jail. Um, the chroot command is how we're going to get into the jail, um, and we're telling it to look at forward slash mnt, and then we're going to do uh, bash, which by the way, even if bash isn't installed on your Alpine Linux uh, hard drive, um, this will actually still work because bash is installed within the jail. Um, and we're going to say just uh, input lines uh, until you get to EOT. Um, so we're going to go ahead and update apt, which, like I mentioned, does not need to be installed on Alpine. It's actually running this ahead of time inside the newly created operating system. Uh, so when you reboot into it, um, you will already have the latest uh, pointers in your repository to all the latest packages. Um, we're going to go ahead and install this right here. This is actually your kernel. Dbootstrap does not add a Linux kernel. Um, we need to add that manually through apt. Um, it's also installing grub. Um, we don't actually need some of these, uh, but if you want to uh, sign your EFI, uh, these are very important. Uh, nextly, we are going to run the grub install command. Uh, we're going to let it know that we're using 64-bit EFI. Um, we're going to tell it where that is. Um, and, to this, and to the jail, it's not mount EFI, it's just EFI because we're within mount, um, as we set up here. Um, I'm going to let it know that it is called Debian, so when we reboot, um, we will be able to see Debian as the name of the newly created system. Um, and then these are just a few other uh, director, like uh, directives. This right here is sometimes essential. Uh, it is Debian only. So if you're running this and trying to install a different operating system, uh, you won't need this. Finally, we use the update grub command. The reason why it doesn't just update automatically is because this is sort of dangerous. It's like modifying your FS tab. We want to make sure everything's done correctly uh, before it continues. If there's an error with this command, uh, like we mentioned earlier, it'll actually cut out of the script, and so it will not negatively affect anything installed on your system. Now these are... I'm going to remove these from uh, the script right before this video gets put up. Um, but what I was doing is I was incorporating some binaries and some files for the uh, home directory um, by default. So uh, some custom programs I had written I can just dump into the binary uh, folder. Now uh, this is sort of how you are going to build your own distribution. Um, if you have particular files you want to be in the system by default, um, you will literally just copy them from your thumb drive um, and then just into your mounted folder. Um, now we're going to see a true in again, and this is where we're going to install some of the programs. Now you don't actually 100% need this section to have a fully, like, sort of in theory functional system. Um, but you won't have any network support, um, you won't have a desktop, uh, perhaps most importantly, you won't even be able to sign in through the TTY, because you won't have a password for your super user. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and just go through this list. Um, this right here is adding um, packages to your APT. Uh, I like the non-free um, category because I like NVIDIA drivers. You can remove this uh, if you don't like having non-free uh, uh, packages in your system. Um, I like supporting 32-bit applications because I like wine. Um, both the drink and the program. 
and this right here is going to update the packages, it's going to upgrade the packages. Let's set up our user. So I'm going to create a new directory called home user. Now obviously you can change this for whatever you want your user to be. Um, so like my name is Ethan, uh, so I could set this to like home Ethan and then have Ethan here and Ethan here and stuff like that. But you, you can set it up however you want. Um, we're going to install sudo. Um, this is not essential, but it is uh, sort of saves uh, you a headache. Um, so we're going to install that, and then we're going to add um, our newly created user to the sudoers directory. Um, and then this is how we're going to set the password for both the root user and the user user. Um, I just set it to password. Do not set it to just password. This is a default. Um, but it's sort of an example of where you would put that in. Um, next. I like STDM, but there are quite a few different um, desktop um, managers you can use. Um, I know that GDM is a popular one. Um, I think, I don't remember what KDE uses, it's probably like KDM or something. Uh, but I like SDM, SDDM because I'm a big open box fan. Um, what's kind of cool is uh, Alpine uses OpenRC, but like I mentioned with APT, we can run systemctl, um, even though... <laughs> even though uh, systemd is not process one um, because of the way jails work. So this enable will make it such that SDM is the first thing that uh, appears on your computer when you have restarted into it. Um, lastly, next we're going to set up internet. Uh, it's very important to make sure that you have uh, localhost inserted into your hostname folder or whatever you want to set your hostname to. Um, I just uh, localhost is a good default for most people. Um, you also want to make sure that your interfaces are set up correctly. So I've went ahead and got my Ethernet set up so that if I have an Ethernet cable plugged in, it'll just work out of the box. Wi-Fi drivers and your Wi-Fi connection are not in here by default. Uh, you will have to incorporate that yourself if you want to. This is just a really simple script. Um, next, uh, lastly for this uh, CH root, um, we're going to be installing the desktop. Um, so I'm installing the X server, I'm installing Xvideo drivers, uh, some Xvideo or Xorg packages, um, Xinit if you want to run that program, a ton of fonts, um, otherwise you'll get just like just boxes um, on some programs and you do not want that. Um, I'm installing Openbox because I am partial towards Openbox, but you can install XFCE or GNOME or whatever, i3, whatever you want. Q terminal. Because uh, it's important to have a terminal application. You can use Xterm if you want, but I'm, I like Qterminal. Uh, and then a screen saver, and then an audio server. Um, and then finally, we're going to take our partition and we are going to put it in FS tab so it knows where to go to boot. And then lastly, for this script, uh, we are going to unmount everything sequentially and we are going to automatically reboot. With that said, uh, this took me a long time to figure out and to put together. Um, there are probably going to be errors in the script and it might not work perfectly on every machine. Please let me know if you find any issues. I will update this as soon as I can and uh, make sure that we have the latest version uh, online. Um, like I said earlier, the link is in the description. Uh, if you have any questions or you notice any problems with this, please ask me. I would love to answer all of your questions that I can. Before I forget, this was uh, using a slightly modified version of the setup script that did not incorporate any uh, X server. Uh, but check it out! I got DVD installed. Uh, so, looking forward to seeing what you guys do with it. Uh, without further ado, happy hacking! <laughs>